I'm Jeff Larson, like Steve Sean said, I'm um, the data editor of ProPublica. Um, but, you know, when you say editor, you think uh, four martini lunches and, like, smoking and, you know, eye shades and a lot of cursing or whatever. I don't, I do curse um, a lot. But uh, uh, I'm actually this weird mix up of, um, uh, you know, a reporter mixed with. Um, a software developer, and I also do data analysis, so big models. So um, on any given day, I'll be looking for data sets to download and analyze and find stories in. Um, I'll be calling and yelling at FOIA officers at agencies like the DOD and the NSA, and just today the FBI. Yesterday was the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. Um, because you know, if you want to talk to me about FOIA, I'll, uh, we'll be here all night. Um, <laughs> And I also, in the past, um, have reported on everything from international money laundering to uh, redistricting, how powerful interests drawing you out of a boat. Um, and I've also uh, did a bunch of work on the Snowden documents. Now, this is a document clustering doc algorithm, um, but we didn't use it in the Snowden documents, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> because we were working on computers that you couldn't install software on. Um, I'm the guy that uh, wrote the Bull Run story in the Angry Bird story um, for uh, the New York Times. Um, that said, I'm not a trained computer scientist or mathematician. Um, part of being in journalism is um, have, being stupid enough to explain concept, uh, complex subjects to normal people. So there is a slight chance, um, probably a very good chance, I might get something wrong in here um, as I'm talking. Um, you guys are all probably much smarter than me. If I screw up, um, just go ahead and give a call. Um, I also have a newborn at home, so I have a little bit of baby brain going on. Um, everything's a little hazy and kind of far out. Um, so tonight, we're going to talk about what is increasingly a bigger and bigger problem in uh, journalism. We keep on getting more and more document dumps, and we have to very quickly, very efficiently, and accurately find the story within those documents. Um, later on tonight, at the end of the talk, I'm gonna go through the three places that we use this algorithm. Um, it's called minhashing, and it's one of, for me, um, one of those like greatest hits, um, one of those aha, like greatest hacks in computer science, right? Um, there's you know other ones I can think of uh, that have to do with like tricks of um, uh, randomness and distribution are things like skip lists or bloom filters or cuckoo hashing, right? Like once you get those, it's like wow, that's amazing. Um, you know, uh, another one that's like a evergreen like that is the, if you've ever looked at the minimum cut algorithm, the minimum cut algorithm of a graph um, is absolutely, like, deals with randomness in a way that's beautiful and elegant and amazing. Um, so, um, there are a slew of document clustering algorithms. One you've probably heard of is k-means, but that doesn't really work for us in journalism because k-means um, is this algorithm where you plot everything in hyperspace. Um, and you pick random points in hyperspace and, and kind of agglomerate all your documents. But for us, that means that you have to know the number of uh, clusters you want to end up with. So I want 10 clusters, but we don't know that ahead of time. And I don't think that most people know, looking at a data set, oh, there's only 10 things that are important. Um, so in, in the introduction to this paper, um, he actually goes through a couple other things. So, there are, you know, things like hamming distance and Levinson uh, distance does, don't really do the kinds of things that he wanted to do, um, which was uh, figure out. Um, so he had a problem. So Broder has a problem. He works at Alta Vista. Does everyone remember Alta Vista? Everyone ever used Alta Vista? <laughs> <laughs> I fucking loved it, right? Um, so he has a problem where, like, on the internet, there's all of these very similar documents. Um, he finds himself in a situation where he has, and you might giggle a little bit at the amount of data here, he has 30 million documents, which is the whole entire web, 
150 gigabytes, and that is too big in 1999 to store anymore. Um, I don't think we have that problem now, but um, it's kind of uh, adorable the way that uh, <laughs> this paper shows up. Um, because right now it looks like my laptop, whatever. Um, so, uh, so he comes up with these two ideas, which if you're familiar with set theory kind of sound a little familiar. So he comes up with resemblance, um, which is um, essentially, I don't know if you guys know, Jacquard similarity. So it's, um, I'm going to screw this up so I'm going to shoot for a second. Um, we're going to skip it a little bit. It is this, which is the intersection of uh, the words in A uh, versus the words in B over the intersection of the words, uh, I mean, over the union of the words of A in the words of B. So it's all the words they have in common versus all the words they have in common plus the words they don't have in common. And if you think of that intuitively, the higher that that trends to one, the more likely those documents are similar. So a similar document would have an intersection, uh, a set intersection of exactly the same as a set union. And then he talks about containment, which is, um, so you can have documents that are of different lengths. So we have the intersection of uh, all the words in A to the in, um, to B over all the words in A. So that'll tell you how well contained A is to B, or B is A. Um, um, so he talks about these two things, and he says that these two <coughs> things are pretty much, um, if you want to talk about similarity of documents, these are two really good measures. Now the problem is if you're doing document clustering, you don't want to have to visit every document and compare it to every other right? Because all of a sudden you get 30, uh, 30 million squared, and if 30 million documents in 150 gigabytes is too much, in 1999, uh, 30 million squared is um, just out of the question. Um, so here it is. Uh, here's the output of his experiment, 30 million documents. They found 3.6 million clusters a turn of these uh, uh, containing a total of 12.3 million documents. So all of a sudden, we're cutting it down by half of the ones that they have to index. Um, later on, we will see that um, this 12.3 million, actually, he can do it in relatively linear time due to um, some constant. Right, so some constant times just a single scan through the document. And that is the reason why I love this paper. Because when I'm working on a deadline, even though I don't have 30 million documents, I may have 120,000 documents, I need to do it fast. I need to find out what's cool about this particular dataset. Um, so this is where we get back into the set intersection. Um, uh, that set theory stuff that we were talking about with resemblance and containment. Um, it turns out, if you guys are familiar with uh, natural language processing, one of the things that you do to capture the structure of a document is you cut it into n grams. So when I have, um, and there's great, he calls them shingles here. I don't really understand. It's like, it's this weird paper where he doesn't rely on known literature at the time, like everything, n grams were a thing. In 1999, he also doesn't mention Jacquard similarity. He's like, I invented this. He goes, no, you didn't, dude. But that's okay. Um, and, and you know, it's, a, it's one way to approach it. But um, so a rose, uh, um, a rose is a rose is a rose. Um, so if we have uh, four shingles or uh, four grams, it would be a rose is a rose is a rose. Blah blah blah. Um, now there's two ways that you can store these shingles, right? You can store them just as the set intersection, um, just as the unique shingles. So a rose is a rose is a rose, is a rose is, right? Which would be the unique, um, all the unique engrams you can pull out of this. Or you could um, store them as uh, the engram plus um, a little here. Can everybody see this? Or am I? Okay. You can store them as the n-gram plus the index where you saw it. Right? So the first time I see a rose is a, I, I add a 1 to it. The second time 
um, I see a rose is, uh, well, that's, I've already seen that before, so I put a two. This is a little better because it captures a little bit more of that structure and information at the cost of storage space, right? Um, you lose, you lose, um, you lose, for example, in this one, you'll lose rose is a rose. Being over here, you'll lose some of that structure if you just take the unique points. So he says option A is pretty great if you want to um, sort of uh, keep that structure when you do the min hashing later. Um, and the thing to know about min hashing is uh, just keep this in mind for later you can um, fix the number of these shingles. So it doesn't have to be four grams. It's just basically K grams. Um, uh, you know, however big you want it to be, obviously the bigger the shingle size, the closer you're going to get to an actual, um, not estimate of the similarity, but the similarity itself. And we'll see why in a second. So again, if you uh, remember, we have resemblance and containment. Um, mostly, I'm going to talk about resemblance. Containment's not super interesting to me, um, just because if one document is contained in another, it doesn't really tell me uh, things for uh, when I'm clustering documents again. Um, but it is important if you're indexing the web, right? You want to know that this uh, document A is uh, um, a summary or an abstract or maybe was cut off from document B. Um, and you do want to have those two sorts of measures uh, if you're indexing. So then he gives some simple calculations which you can kind of figure out yourself um, relatively easy. Um, some stuff. He also mentions that it associates uh, that you can do the triangle inequality. So you can do one minus. Um, and he says this is I always love when you um, <laughs> come across these. It's like so boring, just whatever. I'll write it later. He says, uh, the tedious proof is omitted in this preliminary version. Um, she's like, no, that's, I'm not an expert like you. Um, tell me what it is. Okay. Is there a full version? Um, he wrote another one, which actually goes in much more depth and talks about hashing and, and the way you choose your hashes and that's like 40 papers but you guys all seem like nice people and you don't want to see me stumble through this like very complex like number theory one. <laughs> so it's called the min, um, minimize permutations of documents um, and it goes into a little bit more of the implementation details. This is the first one um, and I think he comes to even uh, another realization that I'll hit on. Um, in this, as we get, this is like, this is, um, this is like in um, Casablanca, this is like the kiss at the end, this is like the amazing part, so pay attention. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, so read that if you understand it, send me an email, I'd love to hear how it works. <laughs> okay, great. So, so far, we haven't talked about, um, ordinal numbers at all. We haven't talked about minimum anything. We also haven't talked about hashing, right? So you can imagine in your head with these two, with these two measures here, you can come up with a pretty simple way to cluster documents, right? And the way to cluster documents using this is to, is to create, a, um, create a seed cluster, right? Assign your first document to that seed cluster compare every other document to that seed cluster using the similarity. If the similarity is high enough, that is in um, your, the, that particular document goes in that first cluster, otherwise create a new cluster. And then do that until you have no more documents left, right? But that is way, 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 way too slow. Um, for reasons we went uh, uh, through up above. So, now, what we're, now we get to this minimum thing. So what we're talking about is there's uh, some sort of, this is like bookkeeping. We want to talk about the minimum set. So we want to say, uh, what does it mean to say, uh, to order these shingles? 
So the first thing we do is a little bit of bookkeeping. We say um, when we have a set, min s is the set of smallest s elements in the set of all of the elements. Um, otherwise, it's just uh, the set of all elements. If you have, if you have, uh, um, if your single, if your sample size is 10, your minimum is 10, uh, and you have a document that only has seven sing shingles that gets promoted into this main function. And then we have this uh, uh, mod function, which is uh, the set of elements in your global set that um, return zero for some constant that you pick, right? Um, we're not really gonna go over this mod function because um, it has to do with uh, um, containment. It helps you with containment, and I'm just not really interested in containment. So, um, but you guys are welcome to. So, um, what we get then, here's our theory. This is the fireworks. Let uh, G, um, was that phi of N be an arbitrary objection? Let pi be a permutation of that Greek letter, chosen uniformly at random, and let, um, so uniformly at random, that should hit, that should, you guys should immediately think, what is taking one thing and turning it into another uniformly at random? That is a hash function. That is SHA-256, right? That is what SHA-256 does. You put a C, you get a uniform distribution out of it, right? So here we're getting hash. We're getting close to this being the min hash table. We have minimums and we have hashes. It turns out that this is um, an, uh, that this function, which is, M, so MA is the minimum set, so the first 10 uh, elements of the hash function of every word in, uh, in document A, right? So it's another function, so minimum set of the hashes of Sorry, word shingles in A, of all the shingles in A, right? So we're ordering our shingles by our hash function, right? And then we have mod, but again, it's for you guys. Um, Question? Yes. Uh, so I, I don't quite understand how it can be a hash function if it's supposed to be a permutation. Well, so that's, what it, that's what it is, right? It's a, it's a discrete... Um, it's a discrete transformation. So you have a you you have a random distribution. You're transforming from one set of a distribution to another that you can order. That's what I, I mean. So maybe you could tie it because because you're trying to tie it to SHA-256. So like, it sounds like it operates on a set of words, and according to the you know omega goes to omega, it should give you another set of words. Oh uh, sure. I mean. So. But it's a, yeah, sure, you could give it another, well, this could be sampling, actually. Um, be a permutation, choose, choose for, uniformly at random. Could, could you show min again? Just to swap a little? Sure. Smallest set of uh, <laughs> S with elements in W. So S is, S is an integer? Like, yeah, 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 but you fix the parameter S. This is the set of the smallest S elements in, in W. So what you're doing is you're taking those shingles and you're converting them into an integer. So if theta goes to theta, that's what a that's what a hash function does, right? You have you have shingle A, it's globally going to be put to shingle B uh, to hash function B. Right? I, I'm having a hard time understanding my like, like programmer notion of SHA two fifty six going to hexadecimal characters versus like this I think, notion. I think G is your hash function. Pi is your permutation because G, the omega to n. It can also be, yeah, that is an injection. You're right. It is that way. So maybe I misunderstand that. Um, but it turns out, well, okay, so this permutation, I'm sorry, this permutation of thy choosing uniformly and random is the sample of all of the shingles, which has, which is going to be important later, right? If you're sampling shingles, then all of a sudden you don't have, um, you don't have to go through all of the shingles in your set, and you you can cut down on the big O notation that you do. 
Right. right. In combination with the man. Right. In combination with the man. That makes sense. Thank you. <coughs> right. Thank you for the clarification. Like I said, baby brain. Um, so, uh, so you have your minimum shingle. It turns out you have uh, uh, the your random permutation, the um, union of that, uh, uh, mixed with the intersection and the intersection. This is beginning to look a lot like that resemblance up top, and he proves it down below over the minimum. Um, so, like you take the ten of your shingles. Um, of this, uh, of your random permutation, the union like that, right? So that looks a lot the same. We can already sort of see the intuition here, right? We can already see, like we can intuit that that's going to somehow match up with this resemblance of a button. Good question. Yeah. Say a little bit more about what he means when he says the smallest ones. So the smallest elements, um, the set of the smallest elements in W, the way that I understand it, and I could draw it out for you once we get to the next part, it will make sense. I'm going through the words now, and I will make, I will point out what the intuition is on the whiteboard in just one second. So just stick with me, um, because this is the way I read papers. Um, um, is I stare at it and it makes sense, and then I figure out what it's actually trying. I figure out the intuition, if not the math, because I'm not a professional. Um, what? <laughs> okay, great, great, great. So clearly, so this is where this is the fireworks. This line right here. So keep an eye on that line. Um, he does. Uh, he does some replacement here. So again, right here we have our random sample is the union right here. And then we take the minimum. But through the property, we can say the random sample of the set intersection is the same thing as the minimum, right? Now what we do is we take, here's our, here's our uh, uh, fingerprint, what we're going to call our fingerprint. So we take let A to be the smallest element in this, in this intersection in this uh, uh, permutation. Now it turns out that the probability um, that that smallest element is um, in this intersection is also is the same as the probability if you take that transformation back out to its source for the smallest shingle of uh, the intersection of the source documents. Now here's, here's where it makes sense. So let's say we have two distributions, right? Document A and document B, right? And if you overlap these things together, can everybody see this? Is this working out for everybody? If you overlap these things, these distributions together, right? So A, and B, if they're similar, they're going to have the same distribution, right? 100% the same. If we're looking at the minimum element, that will always be the same. If we have um, if we have documents that are slightly dissimilar, so one like this and one like this, the minimum element still is highly likely to be the same the closer those documents are to be the same. That's what this says to me. And he says, because that probability works that way, we get a good estimator for what, uh, what our uh, resemblance notion was up above. Does that make sense to everybody? That is the intuition. That is like the genius thing. So all of a sudden, you have a document that you can shingle and hash. Um, you can save, you can also, because we're dealing in probabilities here, you don't have to do the complete entire document. You can sample from that document because the sample of a probability distribution has the same uh, shape as the entire. Can you label your axes? Oh, sure. 
So like, I mean, I drew normal distributions, but really they're uniform distributions, right? Because a lot of the shingles are going to be the same, are going to be unique, right? That's the way words work, they're hypergeometric. So this is number of occurrences, uh, number of occurrences of, uh, it's just a normal distribution, number of occurrences of, the, uh, of a particular shingle, right? And this is the actual score, right? This is the actual hash, disordered, right? And and I'm assuming that like the hash is normally distributed. Distributed. Um, I'm just drawing distributions like you would draw, so that everyone understands. But if they're so if they're uniform, the number of yeah, buckets. yeah, right, exactly, with some number of hash buckets. The uniform distribution, if we have a particularly random sample would look something like, it would look like, um, sorry. it would look like, the actual distribution of these shingles is going to look something like, we're going to have one shingle like this, we're going to have 12 shingles of that size, this kind of thing. But you just take the minimum square, right? Or you take the minimum n if you want to have, if you want to calculate this measure of a if you want to calculate an actual estimate. So what he does from then is he goes and looks at the the uh, the, uh, the containment. He also says uh, this containment measure grows because it's mod and not minimum. Not minimum has so it's not bounded in 10. Remember this LD is the modulus. Um, uh, estimator, um, which is another way to calculate it. So it's like all of the set of elements of W that are zero mod M, so some constant. So it would grow um, by chance. There's a, you know, you can use um, this first one, which is easier to use, or you can use this one, um, this one, which uses that mod thing, which is kind of up to you. Okay, so here's where we get to that uh, random permutation. And he talks about some sort of, um, is some sort of, what you have when you have engrams, if anybody's worked with, uh, with, um, with NLP or whatever, you have a, a, a very big search base, right? So the bigger, more engrams you get, um, the uh, more likely you're going to get uh, new entries into your database. So he says, um, if we use seven words, we'll have about 40 to 50 bytes on average. Um, uh, but I think in a, so um, 40 to 50 bytes on average, but to reduce the storage, we first associate to each single a shorter ID of L bits, um, which is your hash function function or random permutation phi of the set 0 to 2 L. So this is where I got that phi. This is, I knew I didn't make it up. This is where pi is, right? Pi is a random permutation of that. Um, uh, if, we, if you make your hash function too large, if you're using SHA-512, which he doesn't use, then all of a sudden you have, um, we, you can ensure that there will be no collisions between, you can't have um, one unique set match to another ID. Um, but you'll have to pay a storage penalty. It's like any, any. Um, and then he goes through and does some calculations on uh, what exactly are some good ideas for using 2L. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, for using the size of your hash function. Um, and then he says something that's really interesting to me because I never heard of these before. He says, in the actual implementation, uh, outside of all of those considerations for your sizes, um, we, we use Robin, uh, Rabin's fingerprinting, which is sort of, um, basically what you do is you take every, uh, every bit of your string and you turn it into a polynomial. So, um, to create a uh, rabbit fingerprint, you're talking, say we have a 40-bit size string, 
you um, have some random constant a x to the 40 plus x to the 39 all the way down to 1, right? And you add all of those together and all of a sudden you have a very nice hash function. What's great about these, he continues to say, is say some of your shingles don't have 40 bits, these terms all drop out to zero, right? So you start out with 40, 39, say you only get to 20, all of these drop out to zero. It's very fast to create these. There's another um, sort of caveat with grabbing fingerprints. You have to, um, because these numbers begin to get so large, like space the size of the universe large, um, what you have to do is um, you have to divide it by another random polynomial that can't be factored, um, which cuts down so you're not storing all the atoms in the universe. Uh, but he says that that sliding window thing with uh, Rabin fingerprints, so you know, if you have a shingle that's 10 bits, you can store everything from 10 bits to 40 bits, actually helps in this algorithm. Um, and it's really cool, and I've used those before. I mean, like, you can also use, the hash function doesn't matter as long as it has big collision resistance, so sometimes I'll use DGB hash, which I, have you guys, do you guys know DGB hash? Um, it's Daniel Bernstein's hash, and it's, sorry, I'm going to screw it up, it's like you take every byte and you shift it 32 over and add 32 or something like that, and that's all you need to do. <laughs> um, well, actually, I might have it. <laughs> yeah, um, and he, like, you proved it. Um, I will, in one second. Let's see if it's Oh yeah, this is DGB2. This is two. He wrote like one, he like dropped it. I don't know if you know about Daniel Bernstein, but he spent um, 19 years suing the NSA to export cryptography and wrote the native, uh, the NACL uh, library. Um, but this is his hash function that he says is like pretty good. Um, he's, <laughs> don't, put, don't use this for like a public facing hash function because it has crazy, uh, um, collisions and you want to use something like chip hash, sip hash, but like I've done this for min hashing. So you do, you know, it's like your constant is 5381, which he found through his magic brain. And then you just shake over <laughs> five eight bytes, add that H and then, uh, you know, add, uh, add your byte there. And then that's your hash function. Um, so something as simple as that can work if you're worried only about, um, only about uh, loose clustering. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Um, I was following most of the. If you back, back up a bit. Sure. Um, I follow most of what's happening, um, but the pipes. Um, what are the pipes doing in the equation? Uh, it's just. So it's, 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 it's just. So yeah, it's just current. Current. So it's just always. Okay. And then you forward slash. The count. Um, which forward slash? And, and further down. Cool. Yep. Um, <laughs> where's the forward slash? Alright, down the two. Or the two. This thing? No, down the. In his description. Yeah, this description. Oh, uh, it's you. Under him. Or Max. Oh, Max. That's the division. That's the vision. That's just, that's just, this is just the vision. But the insects of forward slash is also good. Right. The important part about this, the important part about all of this, like there's a lot of cool stuff in there and you should really try and figure it out, but the important, the thing that I'm calling attention to that I love, that is really simple to, a simple hash function that you can use with this sliding window by these Robin fingerprints, which are really a slick hack, not as cool as DGB hash two, but um, still very cool. Um, so, okay, so this all seems relative, and then he goes into, um, uh, you know, how many, uh, you know, um, how he, uh, how they're sampling things, you know, random permutation, the, some little tricks that you can do at his scale, but what I want to call attention to is this all seems highly complicated, right? Like, 
you need to then, so you take your thing and then you put it back in the function. But what he does at the very end is the equivalent of an academic uh, mic drop. So what he says, when we're evaluating the resemblance, which again is, is what I'm very, very interested in, um, he says how you can do it and you can, that algorithm that I talked about earlier where you take every document and you assign it to a cluster, you could do that with this. And he says, well, that's going to take R squared over S time. It turns out that what you can do is you can take each of those minimum sets um, and assign them to a hash table, and that hash <coughs> table points to the, your documents, right? So you only store your, like, fingerprints that are 10 wide, right? So you're only storing these <coughs> to here. Um, and those give you a particular fingerprint. Um, and you just assign uh, document IDs as you loop through the list to that particular fingerprint. Um, uh, and you still compare that fingerprint to the fingerprint that you have and during, due to some threshold, as you go through, um, due to some threshold, that finger, uh, you, you either um, create a new cluster or, it's, uh, or you either create a new cluster or um, assign it to uh, the, uh, an existing cluster. So that's the algorithm that we did, uh, that we talked about before. But it turns out that if you just want representative sketches and you want a very fast clustering algorithm, you can take the S most popular fingerprints in a cluster, or simply just the first member of the cluster. <laughs> so you can take a single, so Every document maps directly to one minimum hash. So you can linearly go through the document, calculate your minimum hash, group on that minimum hash, and there's your cluster. And instead of n by uh, n squared um, time, you'll, all of a sudden you have a very, 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 very fast number. All right. So that's that. Um, the way that we have used it in the past, um, we did, we had a minimum, so this is a story that we did about Democrats drawing their own line, their own congressional district lines in uh, California. Um, basically what they did is they set up, a, a California had this sort of hippy dippy idea that they were going to hear from the general public and the general public was going to show up with tons and tons of GeoSmarts and say we need to have these districts because we're all horse people. Um, <laughs> and so with the Democrat, the Democrats in California did, which is actually a thing, um, we're all horse people. There was another one where we need to have a congressional district because uh, it follows the flight of the California condor which is in danger, so um, there was another one, so in Contra Costa, is a very old map and not very accurate, but that was kind of the joke here. In Contra Costa <laughs> County, there's a bunch of Republicans, and um, uh, what they did is they duped the Republicans into, they supported a Republican push, um, this was all clandestine, a Republican push to make Contra Costa County um, all one district, because the Democrats have better numbers than the, uh, um, than the Republicans. Um, and they knew that if it was all one district, it would basically lock down all of California. So you have this district, which is Democratic. You have Stockton becomes Democratic. Alameda becomes Democratic. And you can't go further south than Merced, because Merced is a Voting Rights Act district. So it has to be a certain shape. We used minimum hash to find their campaign where they were sending emails to the, um, hundreds and hundreds of emails, they were sending it to the redistricting commission saying we all, we're Republicans, we all want to um, be in one district. If you've ever been to Contra Costa, it's not very Republican, that's what I mean. But the Republicans <laughs> seem to think so in, Denver, in, in California. Uh, the other one that we did, um, so we got a bunch of documents from uh, an anonymous source, turned out this anonymous source or someone connected to this anonymous source had hacked into the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, uh, the Syrian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and uh, which, you know, I mean, geez, they're not really good at, at uh, securing their networks. 
um, because he finally had to get out because there were so many other people in there. <laughs> he was going to get found out. Um, but we got, um, we got, you know, 100,000 documents for this, and I don't read Arabic. Um, but it turns out that if you tokenize documents, you're just tokenizing documents. I mean, if you're doing language modeling, you have to pay attention to, you know, Eric has all of these like, weird endings and things that happen with words and the way they're spelled. But um, if you're um, just looking for a story, uh, what you can do very quickly is get rid of all of the documents that look the same. So the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Syria um, would write these reports saying, you know, here's everything that happened in Syria, it's really great to be here, um, you know, we're having a, a good old time, they would write them to the UN and they were all the same, just copy and paste every um, thing, we're not, we're not like war criminals, don't worry about this little interaction we have going. So I very quickly could map out the stuff that was not interesting. Um, there's this great document in this trove. Um, you can find it online. I think it's uh, the, the people put it up online afterwards. Um, but there's this great document where they said uh, we need the UN's help because um, the the rebels have stolen 12 of our bicycles, and this will not stand. But like the Syrian government, right? Like you guys are doing worse things to the rebels. Um, that they stole 12 of your documents is not the whole thing. So what we were able to find very deep in are all of these weird flight manifests from, uh, of Syrian planes, um, and they were in English, so I got lucky. Um, uh, Syrian planes flying around Turkey and shipping tons and tons of cash, um, like 16 tons every, every month, um, and which kind of makes sense, right? So you have a civil war going on, you need to pay your army. Um, you used to print your money, so international currency is kind of weird, like most countries don't print their own currency, they go to the Austrians, the Austrians are kind of like the world's greatest at printing currency, so if you ever start a country, you know. Uh, uh, and so, but all of a sudden, in the EU was like, well, you can't export to Syria, so Syria has a problem now, they can't print money, they're running out of money to pay their soldiers, the only reason why the soldiers were sticking around because they're being paid more than the rebels. So all of a sudden, they take this calculation and they say, well, let's just print it in Russia. But now you have another problem because Russia can't fly directly um, to you because it goes over EU countries like Turkey. And Turkey actually shot down or grounded one of these planes, confiscated the 16 tons of cash. Um, and that was not a very good day for the Syrian government. But that's one of the things that we can find. It was a really exciting um, story. We sent a guy, um, they were also going to ship attack helicopters, which would have been a better um, story. And we sent a guy to Russia um, to take pictures of the plane as it took off, so we could confirm. But the plane just sat there and never took off. It turned out later on, um, Russia kind of caved to UN <coughs> Russia as they should have, and, um, uh, and didn't actually ship the attack helicopters. Um, but not due to us, just because the UN works. Um, sometimes. <laughs> um, this is another one that we did, which was uh, focused on political targeting, political email targeting. So we had, uh, you know, about a thousand people sign up to send us emails um, during the presidential campaign. Um, you know those emails like meet Beyonce. It's not really Beyonce, by the way. Um, <laughs> meet Beyonce or President Obama or whatever, and so that becomes a very uh, clustering problem. You have to do that very quickly and online, right? So we used minimum hash um, to. Uh, cluster these things, it's also good, it's the exact same thing as what happens in the Broder paper, right? You have a web filled with similar documents, you don't want to store multiple versions of the documents. There's, they might be changed because someone's email client puts equals everywhere, right? And we need to do it very quickly because we program in Ruby, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> So, so all of a sudden, um, so we're able to identify these different clusters, and it's kind of fascinating to go through, I think, um, but I'm kind of a geek, uh, and see how the message changed based on um, who got the message. So, like this one, you know, people in Florida got one message, people in uh, 
Uh, Tennessee got another one. Uh, New York and, you know, Washington, I think, were the four that we saw, which is, you know, outside of the Tennessee one, um, pretty much our uh, audience. It's like my mom, my brother, um, and my cousin. So, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's how we've used it. And I really, um, you know, hope you sort of, you guys sort of look into it and, and figure out the other two ones that I wasn't very interested. Um, it's uh, it's it's pretty fast. I mean, it's super fast. It's way faster than doing something. Another uh, algorithm that's uh, that does clustering without this great trick of um, knowing how many clusters uh, you have ahead of time is non-negative matrix factorization. That has to do with invertible matrices and everything like that. But that becomes you you get uh, especially if you're doing. <coughs> You get and uh, you hit a wall really quickly with that. So uh, thanks. And uh, two questions. One is, um, do you have like a, a basic working of this up on GitHub, or do you have a good resource that like that goes play with it? No. Nah, I mean, um, there are. I, it's. It's a lot simpler than my tortured explanation is, um, and it's it's really easy to, and it works relatively well. Um, I don't have I don't have any publishable. Code. Okay. I guess the other part, I, I, the other I mean the other thing you can do is if you're not worried about if you're not worried about document structure, you can. There's a hack that works sort of well if you just take the hash of every shingle and take the minimum. One. Then it works in some new for each document. Yeah, for each for each document, and then plot, and then group them by the ID. I, I, I think I, I missed something somewhere. Yeah, but um, so I, I'm not sure I fully understand why. Just because your minimums are uh, close, that that means that your whole document is close. Because it has to do with it has to do with it, it's the probability. So you take the minimum one. Um, it's the probability that the minimum one is in this set is the same as the probability that the unhashed version is in this set. And then all of a sudden you have an estimate for this. So it's my drawing here. <laughs> I'm sorry. So I'm, doing, I'm doing a terrible, terrible, terrible thing of it. But think of it, think of it, think of it this way. Think of it this way. It's very simply. What? Like, the way it, it's not minimums. It's it's not like you sort them. It's that you randomly shove them around. The right, but then you take the minimums. Right. So it's, it's right. So sampling. it is random sampling. If if you have yes, it's random sampling. You have this random hash function that outputs random. Right. Mm -hmm. You're hitting the minimum bucket. Yes. So the the bucket you're number grabbing is the minimum. Bucket. So it's not like it's the minimum of some measurement. Right. It's right. just. You could do the maximum as well. I yeah, know. you could do. Uh, yeah. Yes, Maybe. I think you could do the maximum. You, 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 you just say you're choosing some subset of the buckets consistently, right? And that the buckets are random, are, are uniformly distributed. Yeah. So you have a uniform distribution, right? That is that is essentially random. Let's take the easy case. Let's take the two documents that are exactly the same. The intuition is, if you hash them and you overlay those two distributions and you take the minimum value of those hashes, that will always 100% be the same, even though you're mapping it to, uh, um, you're mapping it to uh, uh, a random function, right? Am I getting confused with the original, like, uh, you know, kind of normalized? Yeah, no, no, you had before, um, where you would expect that even if you know, say your white bias or black bias or whatever, you know, sure. like that, you'd still your minimum might still be the same, even though one could be completely on the left side and one could be. Uh, so, so, so sure, it's I, not I really distribution. It's not really distribution. I just drew those because that people think distribution, okay. right? We're we're talking about uniform distributions are just flat lines. They're not right. interesting things to show. Hmm. Yeah. So I, I, that that can use me as well. So so like. It, it should just be some variance about 
zero, basically, right? About some some men. Excellent. So it just it's just gonna look like a bunch of bars that are all average out around the, the flat line. With the average. Yeah. yeah. And so then so then like if you if you say you have twenty five buckets, like I, I mean I might be wrong, but if you have twenty five buckets, you could pick buckets six, seven, and nine. Right? Like it doesn't matter which ones. He just picks them in because it's index zero, it's easy. It, it, it's easy, it's sortable, computers can do it really well, and you're guaranteed to always have a minimum. And, and you can throw away the other one. Right? You get, well, that's the thing with the sampling, right? You take 200 samples, you don't, if you're dealing at that scale, you don't want to hash the entire document because what happens when you hit upon that one gigabyte time, right? You want to take 200 random samples. You know, and then you hope that your minutes still Right, right, but but, but he, the part of the part that I, I skipped over was him talking about how many of those random samples you need to have. So there's two things that you have to understand with the min hash, the way he has it. The way I do it is I just hash everything and take the minimum one, and if, if those minimums match, there's a pretty good probability that they're the same, right? But um, what uh, what he does is he doesn't want to hash the whole entire document number one because you don't know what's on. Second thing that he does is he talks about um, how many samples you have to take from each document to have a high probability that this works. And that's his whole thing about using rabbit fingerprints and uh, hashes with collisions and like the cl the probability. I would assume though, wouldn't this, doesn't a lot of this rest on the fact that we're talking about natural language and documents which are going to have a certain structure? It's a fairly restricted space. Sure. Yes. Um, it turns out you can do it with like PDFs and stuff. I've done it with PDFs and it totally works. Um, <laughs> it's just like anything that you can like tokenize. The reason why you do min hashing and not something like a, a um, the reason why you do these shingles, you construct these shingles this way, right? There's two ways to construct it. One, which is a little bit more um, sensitive, right? Rose is a rose is the same as a rose is a rose, but this encodes the position. So you get a little bit of more locality, right? So your minimum thing, you add an extra little bit of information. Because the whole idea for this whole entire paper is how much information can we throw away and still have a fast cluster? That can also cause problems. If you have a prefix on file, if you put a cover sheet on the document. Sure. Yeah, of course. Which is why I said I always do option B, because I, do, I don't really give a fuck well, about But that. containment can help <laughs> you yeah. identify those problems. Right? Yeah, containment would help identify that problem. Um, if, if you have, um, you know, if your minimum hash doesn't hit for the resemblance, but you have a contain the containment measure works really well, then all of a sudden, you know, you have to look at both of these if you're doing something like clustering. If you're doing something more rigorous than, like, you know, looking at a Syrian flight process or something, right? <laughs> this is something that I do the first time when I grab a document set and I throw away, um, my workflow is I throw away the top five clusters because I know all of a sudden, journalism is interested in outliers, right? That's where the story is. Um, we don't care what most people do, right? So. <laughs> um, um, so we throw away like the top clusters because most of that is going to be spam, especially if you're dealing with like uh, email. Yeah. 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 All right. Thanks, guys.